Turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. It's in the early part of the Bible, not right at the beginning, but a few books in. I mentioned a couple weeks ago that one of our traditions as a church is occasionally to conduct what we call survey messages. We did one a few weeks ago in the book of Galatians. Uh, Historically, we've done a number of these messages in the Old Testament. Actually, we are preaching in the Old Testament, whether through regular series or survey messages, uh, has led us through Ruth, and we're going to extend that now to the book of 1 Samuel. We take a a break from our, our normally scheduled preaching through a book of the Bible to do an overview series and provide sort of a snapshot of one of the major sections of Scripture. As I've said before, one of the major reasons we do this is we, we want uh, to love all of our Bible. And we want to love its depth, which is how we're exploring Philippians, looking at it very slowly and thoroughly. And we also want to love its breadth, where we see that the various authors and genres, types of literature, also that we love God's Word, Uh, The goal of these survey messages is not at all to study every passage. That would be impossible uh, in the time we could have. But to to whet your appetite, to give you something of an anticipation uh, for this book in your own study. Perhaps to provide something of an overview of its themes and uh, the right way to interpret it generally. So that hopefully that can serve you as you study it on your own. That's what we're looking forward to do this morning uh, (coughs) in this book. So if you turn in your Bibles there, uh, I'd like to read uh, just a a few verses to kind of get us introduced to the book a little bit, if I could. Uh, And then we'll pick and choose various passages to explain its overall structure. But let's let's begin reading where the author begins in verse 1 of chapter 1. And then we'll skip down. I'll read uh, some of chapter 2 as well. There was a certain man... Of Remathaim Zophim of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, the name of the other Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion, because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep and why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? Typically humble husband. After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed, prayed to the Lord, and wept bitterly. She vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And no razor shall touch his head. Skip down to verse 20. We find the answer to that prayer. In due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. She called his name Samuel. For she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. If you go down to chapter 2, we see Hannah's prayer of grateful exaltation. It's, It's worth reading. Largely because Hannah's prayer in some ways could define the theme of 1st and 2nd Samuel. 1st and 2nd Samuel were originally a single book. Uh, They were divided in the Greek translation and subsequently uh, in the 
early part of, of, of this era after the coming of Christ, but they, they really hang together as a single volume. Uh, we're just going to look at the first half, First Samuel, this morning. But this prayer really defines the themes of this book. So let me read it in its entirety because it's, it's worth celebrating. Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord, and my strength is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord. There is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken. But the feeble bind on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust and he lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king. And exalt the power of his anointed. This delightful prayer from this godly woman is the theme of this book. If we were going to summarize it in a moment, we would say we must entrust ourselves to the Lord and to his chosen king. We must entrust ourselves. We must have a a humble trust in the Lord and his chosen king. That's what 1 Samuel intends to do. It intends to direct the readers who would have been Israelites much later uh, in time who are reading this story. It would motivate them to entrust their lives in humble dependence on the Lord. To turn away from wickedness because the wicked who seem strong will be humbled and those who humble themselves before the Lord will be exalted. It would want to give them perspective. That though people in this world can seem impressive, can seem powerful, like Penina, this mocking wife at the beginning of chapter 1, and though some people who follow the Lord can seem broken and barren and weak, in the end, those who have humble trust in the Lord will be exalted, will be preserved, will be lifted up, and those who defy the Lord and look on their strength and their might, they will be humbled. And God will rescue his people through the king that he has chosen. That's the book of 1 Samuel. It's not just a history lesson about what happened in Israel around 1100 B.C. That's not what it's for. It's to motivate God's people to look to him, to not look to the proud or the mighty of this age as though they have some strength that can help them in a moment of need, but to look to the Lord, to be like Hannah so that you can experience, like Hannah, the mighty salvation of this trustworthy God. That's the goal of this book. It does this through multiple stories, but it's all pushing the people in that direction. And I think it pushes us in that direction too. And we need that push. We need the push of 1 Samuel. And for me, these stories, they affect you emotionally in a way that sometimes uh, the directness of epistles uh, don't. They they affect you differently because you can see yourself in the story. You can identify with some of the people and their their need for the Lord. If if you've never read some of the Old Testament narratives for your your personal devotion, let me encourage you to do that. They affect you in a, a different kind of way. They, if you can see through some of the cultural differences, they, they, they help you to see how much we also need to rely on the Lord. Life really hasn't changed that much. 
We still have rivalries today. We still have mighty people of this world and enemies and dangers. And, and all of that is meant through 1 Samuel to drive us to the Lord. And we need that today because our hearts are prone to wander. Over the last couple of weeks, I've had to walk through the devastating news that a, a friend, someone I historically looked up to, admired, has rejected the faith and turned away from the Lord. I'm sure that's happened to many of you, and it's, it's just grieving. It's surprising. It's disappointing. It's unexpected. But mostly, it's sobering. It's sobering because I, I could look back at this person's life, and I could say, I, I don't think I'm smarter than him. I don't think I've had better training than him. I, I don't think I, I've had greater opportunities than him. I, I don't think I'm uh, no more than him. I, I could have, for most of my life, said I don't think I'm, I'm as mature. And so reading and, and seeing him reject the Lord and turn his back on Christianity, on Christ, on God's word, has sobered me. It's reminded me that it, it is possible to walk a long way in this road and then turn aside from God and trust in the thinking of this world. Well, that's why 1 Samuel was written. Because even after all of these stories took place in the history of Israel, the people were still prone to wander. They were still vulnerable to turning away from the Lord and towards the mighty ones of this age. And so I, I need this book. I need the stories that it tells to, to help me think rightly about God and to turn my attention to his power and away from the seemingly powerful of this world, away from the logic of this creation and toward the logic of God's supremacy. I need this book to help me to entrust myself freshly to the Lord because even those who have seemed to follow God as long as I have are not invulnerable to the temptation to fall away, and, and neither are you. You could have followed the Lord for 40 years, and yet your heart is still prone to wander. True Christians continue to press into the Lord, continue to seek after him, and that's what this book is intending to do. Just to give you a basic outline, let me, let me kind of describe the, the basic organization of this book. Obviously, you could be more complex than this, but just for simplicity's sake. The, the first section of the book is mostly about the birth and subsequent ministry of Samuel contrasted with the decline of the high priest Eli and his sons. So this first section, you might say it's about from chapter 1 to chapter 7 or so, it, it walks through several stories, the story of Hannah and Penina, which we just read, the story of Eli and his sinful sons who were priests and their decline in the judgment against them, and then the story of Dagon, a false idol of the Philistines, the enemies of God's people, and Yahweh. This opening section, you might summarize it as the Lord's mercy and judgment. This, this Lord we're to entrust ourselves to defines himself through these stories as being full of mercy and yet one who will judge those who turn away from him. We see this ultimately, his mercy is, is revealed in the story of Hannah as she cries out, and she might be illustrative of the people of Israel at the time. They are, they are not physically barren, all of them, but they are spiritually barren. They are in great need of the Lord. The priesthood, those who are called to lead them in godliness, had gradually declined, so much so that the priest's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were immoral men who literally stole the people's sacrifices as they came to offer them to the Lord. So it was a time of great spiritual decline. A spiritual barrenness had settled into the land. And, and God seeks to oppose this spiritual decline by bringing judgment on Eli the priest and on his sons. Quite literally, Hannah's view of God, that he will remove and work against the arrogant, is fulfilled in the subsequent five chapters. First we read in chapter 2 of a man of God who comes to issue a warning against Eli. In some ways, Eli is contrasted with Samuel and his mother Hannah. 
Eli is somewhat indifferent to the concerns of the Lord's holiness. He allows his sons to remain as priests. And Hophni and Phinehas are outright defiant of God's holiness, doing immoral things even at the very entrance of the tabernacle. So we read this warning in chapter 2. Why then do you scorn my sacrifices and my offerings that I command for my dwelling and honor your sons, this is the Eli, above me by fattening yourselves on the choicest parts of every offering of my people Israel? Therefore, the Lord, the God of Israel declares, I promised that your house and the house of your father should go in and out before me forever. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming when I will cut off your strength and the strength of your father's house, so that there will not be an old man in your house. And in keeping with the standard of having two witnesses in a trial, Samuel himself is told by the Lord, the young boy Samuel is told in chapter 3 to bring this same warning to Eli. So we read in 3 verse 10, the Lord came and stood calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, behold, I'm about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And I declare to him that I'm about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. So we see this picture of God emerge in the opening chapters of this book. He is full of mercy to those who call out to him like Hannah does. But he will bring judgment on those who despise him like Eli and his sons. This is a very important picture of God because today we might prefer to think of God one way or the other. Some of us might like to emphasize, and our culture generally emphasizes the mercy of God, that he's there to help those who are needy and call out to him. We might prefer to not emphasize the judgment of those, even those who are professing believers, who even have positions of leadership, and yet whose heart is far away from the Lord. And God says, no, I will bring judgment on those who just claim to follow me, but whose heart is far from me and who despise my holiness. Eli and Hophni and Phinehas, they will be judged for their manipulation of God's people, claiming to be leaders and yet actually treacherous in their hearts. Whether they be outrightly defiant like these sons or just indifferent and spiritually lazy towards the holiness of God like Eli, they will experience the discipline or the judgment of God. This is contrasted with Samuel. We read in 319 that Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba, that's from the very north to the very south, knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. So we have this Contrast. Contrast is used perpetually throughout this book, where God fulfills Hannah's prayer by by showing it in the lives of two individuals or two groups. Hannah and Samuel experience something of a revival. God is at work. God is revealing his word again to Israel. There is a renewal taking place spiritually. And yet those who falsely came to follow God and merely have external positions of religiosity, they are finally judged and removed. The proud who look to themselves will be disciplined by God. The humble who look to the Lord will be exalted. We see this literally play out. And then actually it takes place. The Philistine army attacks. The Israelites lose the first battle. And then thinking that God can be used as some kind of magic charm, they take the Ark of the Covenant representing their God, God's presence into battle, surely hoping that this will ward off the the enemy's powers. But yet again, they are defeated and the Ark is taken and Hophni and Phinehas are killed. When Eli gets the news, he falls off his chair in dismay and dies. God's judgment, whose warning had come earlier, falls swiftly and abruptly on those who have defied him. 
And lest the Philistines think that they have somehow received God's favor or that their God perhaps is stronger than the God Yahweh, there's this subsequent story in the rest of the chapters that actually is somewhat humorous if you read it. It's, it's actually fun to read, where they take the ark of God into the temple of their God, Dagon, as kind of a submissive trophy. We have beat the God of Israel. And the next morning they wake up and, and their idol, Dagon, has fallen on his face before the ark of God. And it's intentionally tongue-in-cheek biblical humor that the idol has to be picked up and put back in his place. So when we read this as a family and read stories like this, I try to bring out the humor for my kids and say, look, what kind of God needs to be picked up? That's the point. So they put him back in his place, and I don't know if they had to glue him together or what, but they put him there, and the next morning they, they come back and he's fallen down again, and his head fell off and his hands fell off. And he's just there on the floor. And then then they're really worried, so they start carting the ark around the different places of the towns of Philistia. And everywhere it goes, the people get sick with tumors and and destruction. And eventually they they have to surrender, and they send the ark humbly with tokens of honor and sacrifice back to the people of Israel. It's 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 a biblical Humorous story of God saying, uh, just to be clear, you didn't win this battle because Dagon is stronger than me. You won this battle because my people have rejected me. I am supreme. Dagon can't even keep his statue intact. And if you don't send me back to where I want to be, and this symbol representing my presence, you will experience my judgment as well. Judgment comes on all those who boast in themselves, who exalt themselves, and yet the humble will be lifted up. That's, that's the point of these opening seven chapters. There is a God, there is a God who calls people to himself in humble dependence and who will judge those who defy him and who lift themselves up instead of him. Whether it's an uncircumcised Philistine who's never known about Yahweh in any humble way, or it's those who falsely profess to follow God, but whose hearts are far from him, like Eli and Hophni and Phinehas. The religious rebels and the pagan rebels will likewise be judged before the Lord. You can imagine an Israelite child reading this in the centuries, perhaps after David's kingdom, and and hearing and and thinking, "We, we must not reject the Lord. We must not claim to be followers of God, and yet our heart's far from him. And that same message is needed in the church. The church needs a heart that humbly trusts in God like Hannah, who believes him to be supreme over the gods of this age, who does not bow to them and cower before them, but instead entrusts themselves wholly to him. That's the point of these first seven chapters. Samuel is elevated, Hannah is elevated, Eli is dismayed and finally judged. His children are destroyed. His house begins to decline. The Lord of mercy and judgment. In chapter 8, there is a transition Uh, to the next chapter, next section of this book. We might call it the Lord's rejection. The Lord's rejection. There is something of a renewal that happens in chapter 7. Samuel calls the people before him. There is a time of repentance. And apparently for many years, even decades, the people basically follow the Lord under the leadership of Samuel. But then Samuel gets old and in some ways, like Eli, his own sons do not follow in his footsteps. And yet it appears that he does restrain them in some way, unlike Eli. But there is a a concern about the future. What's going to happen in the future? Samuel is getting old now. Who, who, Who will lead us? Who will watch out for us? And there is this shocking moment in chapter 8 when the people decide that God is not sufficient to protect them. So we read in chapter 8, verse 4, Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people and all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. 
according to all the deeds that they have done, from the day I brought them out of Egypt even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. This is a a crucial moment where God's people choose a king which God intended to give them all along. We read about a a king in in some of the books of Moses, that God had this intention of bringing them a king. But the key here is that their motive is to be like the other nations, to have a king who will be a savior for them, who will protect them, and a rejection of God, saying, I don't trust the kingship that the Lord will bring. You must bring us a king who will protect us, Samuel. The Lord perceives in their heart that there is a, a longing to trust in a, a figure of human might who will be a, a symbol of their power, who will represent them, who will stand in for them, who will fight their battles. Not, not a king who will lead them in entrusting themselves to Yahweh and to the Lord. Who, not a king who will help them to see God as sufficient. A king who will in himself be a savior for them. Sadly, people choose to reject the Lord and to prefer a king. Now, somewhat surprisingly, God works within their desire and the request to give them the kind of king that they want. And so the following chapters follow the tragedy of King Saul. It's a, a story where there's an initially a good start and then a, a sad and tragic decline. Saul starts out somewhat humble And open to God's leading, he begins to experience the victories that come to those who depend on the Lord in this era. But but then he begins to look to uh, the people and turns away from the Lord. And gradually there is a decline, ultimately to the point of a rejection by God. That's why we call the section, The Rejection of the Lord. The people first reject the Lord, and then ultimately the Lord rejects Saul. We can read about the Lord's Rejection of Saul in chapter 13, Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. We read again, a secondary charge comes in chapter 15. You want to notice these these two witnesses. It happens with Eli. It happens again with Samuel. It's God almost confirming by a repeated story the absolute nature of their failure. 15, 17, after another moment of disobedience, the Lord says, The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go, devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what is evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission in which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took the spoil, sheep and oxen, the best of the things, devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. You can read in chapter 15 this, this lengthy chapter of excuses from Saul about how he actually was obeying when in fact he had disobeyed. And Samuel says, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, to listen than the fat of rams. Rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Boy, there's a a phrase that our modern era should hear. Do we think we are better than unsophisticated pagan idol worshipers. Rebellion is as the sin of divination. It's like seeking after the guidance of a false god. Presumption, presuming on God's grace, presuming on God's indulgence, it's as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, Samuel says, he has rejected you from being king. 
the tragedy of Saul is that he starts well and finishes tragically. Somewhat like Eli, he finishes poorly. There's a, there's a motivation in the book of, of Samuel to all of God's people and to not be like these leaders who start well and, and finish poorly. It, it's good for us to consider, if you've been a Christian a long time and you have a reasonable level of maturity and maybe you've been following God for years, consider the fact that Saul started well, finished poorly, and didn't finish following God at all. Of course, we know the promise that those who are truly saved, truly Christians, God will preserve to the end. But we also know that there are those who can look like Christians who, after many, many years of seeming to follow him, ultimately reject God. And we're not the Lord. We're not omniscient even about our own heart. So it would be wise for us to be sobered by these examples. The tragedy of King Saul, we might define the the middle of this book of 1 Samuel as the the tragedy of King Saul, a, a great start and a tragic finish. The Lord rejects you, Samuel says to Saul. You will not be the king of my people. The people rejected the Lord as king. Saul rejects the Lord, and then the Lord rejects Saul. I would title this section, The Lord's Rejection. What will happen? What will happen? This is precisely where we find this book as it heads into chapter 16. 16. The people have an aging prophet who is seeking to lead them spiritually but soon will die. They have a king who has been rejected by God because it does not take seriously the holiness of God. They are in decline, and certainly the people reading this book over the centuries would know how true that pattern has been for God's people. When the leaders reject God, ultimately the congregation will reject God, and ultimately those who defy God will not find themselves receiving the favor of God. No matter what they think of themselves, what God thinks of them is that those who continually reject the Lord will be rejected by the Lord. But God will not give up on his people. Despite countless moments of rebellion, countless times of turning away from him, and even this king that they've chosen doing what God promised he would do, and receiving the rejection of God, God is still at work. So God tells Samuel he has a task for him before he dies. Go, he tells Samuel, chapter 16. You turn in your Bibles, it's it's worth reading. It's worth seeing this in the context of all that's happened. Eli fails, Hophni and Phinehas fail, Samuel is now aging, his sins have failed. What does God do? Did he say, forget it? Forget it, you are worthless, stiff-necked people. I'm giving you what you want. Destruction by the Philistines. I will not help you anymore. No. Look at God. The eternal covenant-keeping God. In chapter 16, verse 1. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. If you know the story of Ruth, you know that God's making of this king was generations in the past. God rescues a Moabite woman named Ruth. He brings her to Israel with her mother-in-law, Naomi. This righteous man named Boaz rescues them from poverty and destruction They have a child, that child has a child, and eventually that line produces Jesse, the father of David. So all this time, the people have been demanding a king and rejecting the Lord and clinging to idols and turning away from him. God has been waiting and watching. And now he sends Samuel, go. I have provided myself a king from among Jesse's sons. 
crucial point to feel and understand is that when Samuel comes, he, even Samuel, is still assuming that the, the king God would choose, the Lord's chosen king, which is how I define this section, the Lord's chosen king, surely can be seen by external appearance. Surely he's like Saul. He's tall and handsome and strong. God says, no, Samuel, you're, you're still not getting it. My king will not be perceived by the eye. He won't appear strong. He will appear weak and vulnerable. He won't seem mighty. And that's the point. He'll seem like Hannah, weak and vulnerable. Keep your eye out. Keep your eye out. My king is not going to be the one you would expect. So he says, verse 16, when he came, he looked on Eliab, David's older brother, and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Eliab must have been impressive to look at, I guess. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Throughout the remainder of this book, David is portrayed as a man after God's own heart. A man who righteously trusts in the Lord, who courageously faces God's enemies, who will stand in for God's people. He is contrasted with Saul who has turned away from the Lord and is shown to be weak and confused in increasing ways throughout the remainder of the book. In contrast with David who is shown to be strong and faith-filled. We read, for example, at the end of the anointing in chapter 16, it says the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. Then there's these stories of David's courage in spite of his apparent weakness. We read the well-known story of David and Goliath where it says this in 1736. David, speaking to Saul, says, Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. As with Hannah, David's trust in the Lord is vindicated as God watches over him with miraculous, incredible protection. The rest of the book is this study in irony. David is this weak, vulnerable one who seeks to be thwarted in every way, even by Saul, who becomes jealous of him. Saul looks for ways to to trap him in battle. He he seeks to, to kill him directly. He seeks to call out the entire army to hunt after David. You have David with this ragged band of followers wandering around the wilderness, hiding in caves, and yet somehow David continues to be strong and achieve victories and even be a blessing to the people, and Saul continues to decline. The same picture with Hannah is portrayed with David and Saul. God's chosen king is seemingly weak, seemingly vulnerable, seemingly helpless, And yet, ironically, on two different occasions, Saul, with his entire army, is literally delivered into the hands of David to decide what he will do with him. David operates righteously, almost indifferent to his own safety and his own self-interests. And Saul acts eagerly and enviously, looking to promote himself and destroy this rival. And yet, David is preserved. In the end, we see that Saul falls. There's more here than just a history lesson. God is showing the truthfulness of Hannah's opening prayer. It is the humble one who seeks the Lord. And the ultimate example of that will be seen in my chosen king. My chosen king is not going to be a man who seems proud, who seems domineering, who seems exalted. He will seem vulnerable and weak. It will seem as though there's no chance for him even to survive. And yet somehow... Somehow he is preserved, and the one who seems mighty, the one with all the arms and the the armies and the power, he, he will actually ultimately decline. All kinds of wonderful stories happen in this section at the end of 1 Samuel where, where, where David is delivered and Saul is dismayed. Again and again and again we see David preserved as he trusts in the Lord. Until finally... 
it reaches the conclusion of this book. We read these two paragraphs right next to each other at the end of chapter 30 and the beginning of chapter 31. And the rise of David and the fall of Saul is brought to a conclusion. 30, chapter 26, another story about David. It says, when David came to Ziklag, that was his town, he sent part of the spoil from the battle he had just won to his friends, the elders of Judah, saying, here is a present for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. It was for those in Bethel and Ramoth of the Negeb and Jatir and Aror and Sifmoth and Eshtimoa and Rakal in the cities of the Jerihamelites and the cities of the Kenites and Hormah and Borashan and Athak and Hebron for all the places where David and his men had roamed. So you have David the fugitive bestowing gifts and blessings on all those who have been kind to him in his travels. And then we read Saul. Chapter 31, verse 7. When the men of Israel were on the other side of the valley and those beyond the Jordan saw that the men of Israel had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they abandoned their cities and fled. And the Philistines came and lived in them. The next day when the Philistines came to strip the slain, they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. So they cut off his head, stripped off his armor, And sent messengers throughout the land of the Philistines to carry the good news to the house of their idols and to the people. They put his armor in the temple of Ashtaroth and they fastened his body to the wall of Bethshan. If we're discerning, we can go back to the beginning and read the same thing in song form. Chapter 2, verse 4. The bows of the mighty are broken but the feeble bind on strength those who were full have hired themselves out for bread but those who are hungry have ceased to hunger he will guard the feet of his faithful ones but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness the Lord will judge the ends of the earth he will give strength to his king and he will exalt the power of his anointed What does this do for God's people? Entrust yourself to the Lord and to his chosen king. Do not look to the proud, to the mighty, because their future is certain. They will be destroyed and brought to shame, brought to nothing. Don't be impressed by Saul's army. Don't be impressed by his armor, for the Lord has rejected him. His end is certain. Don't be despised or ashamed or embarrassed by David's ragtag band in the wilderness. His apparent vulnerability, his apparent weakness, because the Lord has exalted him and the people will receive spoils from his victories. Now, David, as we well know, is not God's ultimate king. Actually, that's significantly one of the points of 2 Samuel. To make it very clear that though he is in many ways an ideal kind of king, yet he is not perfect. And he also has failures. Not like Saul's, he's never rejected by the Lord and he never rejects the Lord. But he's clearly not the ultimate king. He's not the ultimate anointed one. He's the best picture that we have, but he's just a picture. So for a a New Testament, someone who's in this era looking backwards, we can see God's wisdom. What's God doing? What's God planning? God's showing something in advance. God's showing a pattern that will ultimately be revealed with the coming of David's ultimate son. The son of David. David. That's why when those crowds, when Jesus came into Jerusalem, were shouting, Hosanna! To the son of David, they called him. The son of David, what does that mean? It means he's the king. It means he's the new king. It means he's the anointed one that God will exalt. It means he's the one whose horn will be exalted. It means he's the one who's going to be like David. So someone who knew their Bible, who knew 1 Samuel, would look at Jesus as he's being marched up the hill towards Calvary, and they would say, you know, I'm not sure we should be dismayed. I'm not sure we should be hopeless. 
Because in his moments of weakness, God often brings about a great victory. The one who seems to be weak is actually strong. Those who seem to be strong are actually weak. Those who are actually humble in following God will be exalted. And this one is more humble than anyone we've ever seen before. He seems despised. The kings of the earth don't recognize him as a mighty one. But in the end, God will take his spoil and spread it among his people. So you can read 1 Samuel as a, a depiction of the coming king. The people were told, look for a king that will help you follow the great king, the Lord. Look for a king who may appear despised, who may seem weak, who will help you stay away from these false gods, who won't die like Samuel and succumb to death. He, he won't give up the people to the suffering that comes as a result of turning away from God. No, he'll, he'll be a king that will be exalted. And when we come to the New Testament, we can look at Jesus, the son of David, the heir of David, and we can say, look, look, the king has come. He seemed weak, but in that weakness he was strong. He seemed vulnerable, but the Lord has exalted him. When he died on the cross, it seemed as though the great enemies, the powers of the age had overcome him. But just like the ark in that false god's temple, the very act of bringing this one into the temple of evil resulted in evil's destruction. The very act of triumphing over him resulted in him triumphing over them. The very act of pursuing him resulted in God bringing about his ultimate victory. The very appearance of his weakness was actually God showcasing his strength. He may have seemed Hopeless and helpless like Hannah. But in the end, he would be exalted. He would be seen as the anointed of the Lord. And the Lord himself would be the king of his people. So you can read 1 Samuel and as a Christian, your heart can say, what a king we have in the Lord Jesus. What a one who is the man after God's own heart. Is this one who is the image of the invisible God? Is this one who knew no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth? When threatening, he did not revile. In return, he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. And God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So that Hannah's prayer, this barren woman's prayer, would be fulfilled. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king. And he will exalt the power of his anointed. Brothers and sisters, we live in a time where evil seems powerful. It is is only powerful temporarily. We live in a time where mighty ones roam the earth looking for those whom they can devour. But our king seems weak. Does he not? Does he not seem weak, mockable, scornable, belittled, derided, archaic, does he not seem weak? But in the end, those who seek to destroy him will be like Saul, put to open shame before God himself. And this one who seems lowly, who seems weak, whose followers seem like a ragtag band of misfits in the wilderness, will ultimately be the ones who receive the spoils of his victory. 1 Samuel is intended to tell us, look, when you see the king and his people derided, when it seems that the evil mighty ones of this age seem all powerful, when you are tempted to look at your own barrenness and your own weakness and surrender to hopelessness and fear, remember, all of this has happened before and it will happen again in even greater measure. God's people seem weak just like their king does and did.
But God's people will see him exalted, just as David was. And they will see their enemies destroyed, just as Saul was. Entrust yourself to the Lord. The writer of 1 Samuel would urge us. And to his chosen king, King Jesus, the Lord himself who reigns over his people. Do not look to the proud. Do not be impressed by their strength. Do not be dismayed at their vigilance against you. Do not be concerned when their armies surround. No, do not be afraid. Because the Lord will exalt his anointed. And all those who put their faith in him will never be ashamed. Lord Jesus, I want to pray for any person here who has faced intimidation by our culture or the derision of this world, who has been tempted to buy into the thinking of this world that makes you seem small and worldly things big. I pray for everyone who feels like they're in a season of of weakness and vulnerability, or maybe even they've been mocked like Hannah was. I pray, Lord, that you would reveal to them your mighty power. That they would entrust themselves and their weakness to you. Lord, I pray also for any person here who has been walking around in the garb of religion, like Eli and his sons, but whose heart is indulging in wickedness or lazy towards holiness. I pray, Lord, that before it is too late, you would call their heart back to you. You would bring them to repentance. You would give them tears of remorse for their sin. And you would call all of us to a fresh dedication of ourselves to holiness. Lord, thank you for coming as our king. We gladly and proudly proclaim you as our Lord. We would rather be in the wilderness with you. We would rather stand as your attendants watching you fight the battle against God's enemies. We would rather be associated with you and seem weak and despised and vulnerable because we believe that you will be exalted above every name and every ruler and every power. We gladly claim our allegiance belongs to you. Receive the glory, Lord Jesus.